Uh, my name is Vivek Jha. I am the executive director of the George Institute for Global Health, which is a healthcare research organization. I also have a position as the chair of global kidney health at the Imperial College London. And I am an adjunct professor of medicine at University of New South Wales in Sydney. I have another hat, which is that of the current president of the International Society of Nephrology. The word nephrology means the study of kidney disease. So as you can imagine, I'm a student of kidney diseases, a lifelong student. Um, of course, uh, uh, I'm curious about a number of other things, but that's just the basic trade that I applied in for most of my life. But for last six years or so, uh, as the executive director of the Jordan Institute for Global Health, I've been very lucky to have been working with a group of talented researchers uh, who shared the mission of the Jordan Institute, which is to improve the health of millions of people worldwide. Now, you would say, you know, how do you do that? Everyone is trying to do the, that same thing. And I agree with you. Uh, but our approach is to generate evidence uh, that helps in, uh, you know, uh, implementation of practices, policies, uh, programs, etc. That can be implemented in, on, on a large scale in communities, especially uh, in poor communities, vulnerable communities, disadvantaged communities, etc. Uh, in a way that is uh, um, cheap, that can be scaled up and uh, that is sustainable over the long uh, run of time. I guess one, could you kind of just give an overview of the different projects that George Institute is, is undertaking around COVID? But also I'd, I'd be really interested to hear you talk about um, the fact that you didn't work in communicable diseases before um, and kind of what were your motivations of getting involved with the, this pandemic outbreak now? And, and was it that nexus of, of the impact of of COVID on people with non-communicable diseases or, or is that something that you learned later? Let me just start from the beginning. So like I said, uh, the mission of the George Institute is to focus on the most important health conditions um, in our current times. Uh, and we did realize that until before COVID had come along that uh, non-communicable diseases, chronic conditions were emerging as the most important health challenges for humanity. Uh, especially multi-morbidity, people with multiple conditions like this. So that's what we were focused on. But since COVID has come along, I think there is no doubt that this is right now the most important health condition. Uh, not only the health condition, the most important condition that humanity has been faced with in our lifetimes, I think in the last century until the, you know, since the time of the last uh, influenza pandemic. So it makes uh, perfect sense and completely, uh, it is completely logical for us to, uh, to tackle this particular issue using the expertise that we have, which is around, uh, like I said, using rigorous methodology to collect experience by doing uh, randomized clinical trials. Because, you know, one of the things that uh, everyone has been obsessed about uh, right from the time the pandemic broke is to find the best therapeutic uh, options for managing people with COVID or preventing uh, people from developing this infection. Can you can you just share some other uh, challenges? Like, were there were there things that you anticipated that 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 didn't emerge, or were there some unexpected challenges that emerged? And I guess could you talk to that and and how you were able to uh, respond to those and move forward? Uh, well, to your first question, uh, had were there things that we anticipated that didn't emerge? We always anticipate the worst. So, uh, <laughs> so that whatever happens, we are always pleased that uh, you know, uh, it's been better than what we had anticipated. Uh, right. But look, uh, I think what we had anticipated, uh, I mean, jokes aside, what we had anticipated that a number of sites would be completely overwhelmed by the magnitude of clinical work and they just wouldn't have the time to uh, even talk about a clinical trial. Uh, many of these people are saving, uh, trying to save lives uh, every minute, and uh, to at least a few of them uh, doing a clinical trial uh, might seem like uh, a luxury or an, an afterthought. Uh, but I have to say that uh, there have been, uh, for sure, a few people or a few groups that were not interested. But by an overwhelming majority, we have uh, we have received encouraging response. And people have, uh, you know, uh, realized the value of why we need to do clinical trials. Uh, 
and uh, you know uh, not that things have been absolutely smooth but that has not been because of lack of desire on the part of investigators even when an investigator agrees then he or she has to make sure that they are uh, uh, they are able to uh, fulfill or follow all the process of their institutions and so on so there have been some delays there because the uh, uh, even though the clinic uh, the 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 healthcare establishment understands this the administrative establishment often doesn't understand the value of a clinical trial and they remain fixated on uh, ticking uh, every single box uh, you know dotting every i and, and crossing every t which which causes delays uh, so we have had to be patient but i think uh, still we have uh, we have been able to uh, do things uh, you know, uh, in a way that that's not the worst that could have happened. Really. I mean, so that's that's the one. And then the third is uh, making sure that in this time we don't shortcut any processes. For example, one of the principles of clinical trial is to uh, to take appropriate informed consent. So uh, taking informed consent for, from a sick patient with COVID is not easy, uh, and and we need to depend on the ability of the uh, clinical trial. Uh, people uh, on site to be able to do that appropriately uh, and you know so that requires some training which we have provided to them uh, and we have been you know uh, doing that uh, as i said in the beginning we recognize that uh, we have to set ourselves up for success success not in in by way of uh, predicting what will work what will not work but by making sure that we do the clinical trial well and we are able to uh, get to the goal of finishing the clinical trial in a rigorous way. You know, the results are what they will be, right? I mean, we, we don't want to predict that and we don't want to bias that as well. So uh, so that that has been our goal. And I, I'm, I'm pleased to say that we have met with, uh, you know, with a great deal of success in that. In thinking about kind of your hopes or your aspirations for for the projects that George Institute is taking on now, what are what are some of your kind of short term hopes and, and aspirations, as well as the the long term um, aspirations? Or short term uh, short term aspirations are like any other organization, and I would be remiss in my duty as an executive director of the organization if I did not mention that our one of our important short term aspirations is to make sure that uh, our organization remains strong, our staff is appropriately taken care of. Uh, our uh, you know research projects are managed appropriately so that they they still deliver what they you know the best evidence that they can uh, uh, given the circumstances so we are very focused on making sure that we continue to support our staff uh, you know uh, in 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 their hours of need and mental health issues and and people having to work from home finding work life balance etc is is not trivial uh, and and we, we we do recognize that as uh, i think all the organizations are going through uh, the short term medium term as well as long term future uh, employees are stressed they are stressed not only by the fact that they find it uh, they find themselves at a loss on how to deliver the project but also some of some of the people are worried about the long term future right i mean so we and we have to make sure that we really keep uh, uh, keep assuring them of of uh, you know uh, the possible all possible outcomes and 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 their long term uh, uh, se job security etc so that's that's number one the second is of course to make sure in the short term that uh, these covid related projects that we have taken up we are able to successfully complete those the third that we have done uh, also very quickly is to embed covid in some of our ongoing projects because uh, it goes without saying that uh, any aspect uh, and I'm repeating myself like sixth time uh, that all aspects of healthcare have been affected by COVID. One other uh, process driven uh, aspect that uh, we have become very focused on is how to do research during COVID, you know, because people cannot go to communities, uh, patients cannot come to hospitals. So for example, clinical our clinical trials that have been going on for the last four or five or six years, some of them depend on patients coming back to hospitals every month or every three months or whatever, right? But right now they can't do that. So how do we collect data on these individuals? So we are having to develop new processes, uh, developing rapid uh, rapid methods of remotely collecting data, uh, uh, both data that are uh, that are simple outcome related data, but in some cases we, we need 
you know even more detailed data how do we get that data so you know developing those processes uh, are, are important right now uh, for that specific research project but it also gives us lessons to then develop uh, more efficient ways of doing research in the future what is the, uh, uh, one or a few things that you wish everyone would know about the, the community you're working in and, um, and just the, the people um, that are part of your research studies? But I think I have to say this is resilience uh, in the face of such extreme adversity, especially uh, and a kind of adversity that brings uh, to focus the inequities that exist in our, in our societies in sharp relief. Right? Uh, and in this situation, how people who have pretty much lost everything are still uh, uh, trying their utmost to uh, to do their best, you know, uh, in in this given situation. Uh, I guess that's the only word I could have. And I wish uh, you know our health systems, our general societal response uh, to this pandemic. Uh, it's been it's been so exacerbated by this pandemic, but this is not something which is unique, right? I mean, this, this so it, it simply has brought to uh, to the surface the 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 deep fissures in our society and the deep divisions in our society, uh, which have created uh, you know uh, several communities uh, of haves of two different degrees and have-nots to uh, to a hugely different uh, degree. And that that gulf uh, uh, is is very apparent, and uh, I don't know what will it take to uh, you know to reduce this. It's not going to happen in a hurry. Uh, but if uh, from this, if the society just comes out with this lesson that we need to do whatever we can to uh, to reduce this gulf, to minimize this gulf, uh, I think that would have been uh, uh, that would have been. Uh, as I say, a silver lining to this extremely, extremely dark cloud.